Well, Mike, what do we have today? What were you doing 45 years ago? Let's see, 45 years ago would have been uh, 1978. I was, I had just left staff with Campus Crusade for Christ, and I started my first year at Dallas Theological Seminary. Okay, I, I was actually, I think, maybe first or second grade, but <laughs> today we're actually going to be looking at uh, what John MacArthur was not just doing, but what was he teaching 45 years ago. So we have this first clip where uh, John MacArthur explains how to be saved or how to become a Christian. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look here. We'll see what he's saying back then. Yeah. A Christian is somebody who has placed his personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who believes that Jesus is God, who entered into the world, who lived, who died on a cross as an atonement for sin, who rose on the third day. Somebody who believes that. Paul says, if we believe in our heart that God is raised from the dead, if we confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord, we are saved. So that a Christian not someone who goes to church necessarily, uh, not someone who does good things, although I hope Christians go to church and do good things, but a Christian is one who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation. Yeah, now that's a very interesting clip. He became the pastor of Grace Community Church in 1969, so he would have been pastor at Grace Community Church for about nine years at that point. But what I found fascinating is that in this clip, although it's not crystal clear, he basically says, in order to be born again, you need to believe in Jesus' deity, his death, and his resurrection. And you need, what did he say at the end? You need to believe in him for your salvation? Yeah, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation. Yeah, I mean, that's what we say. Yeah. We say that in order to be born again, a person must believe the promise of everlasting life, like John 3.16. I must believe by faith in Him. I have everlasting life. I'm never going to perish. So basically, he was essentially a free grace person. Yeah, I, I, I was kind of amazed that I didn't hear the words from him, the repent, obey, uh, surrender, make Him Lord of your life. Well, it all disappeared. Uh, you know, all is this the of that same guy? In fact, he said at one point, he said, look, you don't become a Christian by going to church or by doing good works. And he said, I hope you go to church. I hope you do good works. Well, he wouldn't say that today. In fact, we're going to see a clip in a minute where he says, if you're not doing good works, if you're not going to church, you prove you're not born again. So there's a radical shift. And I might point out, Mike, in 1989, which was about 10 years after this first clip, I spoke at a meeting of Bible scholars in San Diego, California, and after uh, on repentance and salvation, and after I spoke, five people hung around, and they were all five members of John MacArthur's church, Grace Community Church. And the Gospel According to Jesus had been published by then, right? The Gospel According to Jesus came out one year before, in 1988. Mm -hmm. And they all had been in the church for at least 20 years. So from the beginning, when he became pastor in 69, they'd all been there. And to a man, all five said, before 1980, he believed in the free grace of God that were saved by grace through faith apart from works. And they all said in 1980, he went on a sabbatical, he studied Puritan writings, and he came back and did a five-year series on Matthew that became a book called The Gospel According to Jesus. And so they all said we saw a radical change in his preaching. And I think we can see it from the clip we just saw to the clip we're going to see, which is from what, 2022? Yeah, just last year. And uh, he's actually, in this clip, he's actually answering the question, you know, how can I know for sure that I have, you know, eternal life? And does he have one answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Not quite. Yeah, but let's, uh, we'll let you guys uh, be the judge of that. Right. So take a look at this clip here. Take a look. Pastor John, my question for you is how can someone, how can I have assurance of my salvation? Forever. So all you want to know is, is my salvation forever? And here's how you know. I think there are three tests and then a fourth comment. Test number one is, what do you love? What do you love? If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, new things come. What, what are these new things? I, I like to think of them as new affections. So the first mark of a believer, it's not perfect love, but it's evident love. What, what do you love? You love the Lord, 
you love his word. You know, you don't love him like you should. It needs to be increased. You don't love the word like you should, but you love those things. You love the people of God. You want to be with his people. You want to be in the church. You want to be a part of a worshiping group. So love is the first evidence of a transformed heart. The second one is humility. There's a sense in which you are aware of your sinfulness and you never really get over this incredible grace that's been given to you to mm -hmm. save you. The third one is obedience. It's not perfect obedience, but it's a longing in your heart to obey the Lord. You do acknowledge him as Lord you want to obey. So love, humility, and obedience. And then the fourth thing is this. The single most uh, validating reality in life for your faith is not some idea in your head, it's trials. It's what can your faith survive? You know, people who say, well, I believe in the Lord and something goes wrong in their life and they walk out. Well, that's not a saving faith. That's not a faith that's a gift from God because that lasts. So you take Job as an illustration. Mm. Devastation. I mean, just devastation every way you could cut it. And he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So when you go through a trial, maybe your mom is, is, gets cancer or maybe your dad dies or maybe some horrible thing happens or maybe you're invested in a relationship and you know the, the person you're interested in walks away from you or whatever the issue is, maybe you get an illness. Does your faith stay intact through that trial? That's what Peter's talking about when he says it's those kinds of trials that validate your faith. And okay, wow, that sounded uh, quite different from what we just saw earlier. I think so. Now, he instead of one thing, believe in Jesus for your salvation, we have four things, none of which are about what you believe. Yeah, he had this uh, four-step test. Uh, so what are the, what's the first test? Uh, what, do you, who, what do you love, or I guess who do you love? You know? Yeah, so like do you love God's Word? Do you love God's people? people. Uh, do you, do you, uh, do you love, love God? Jesus? Yeah. yeah, do you love Jesus? Do you love obeying Him, etc.? Well, is that objective, Mike, or subjective? Well, I think everyone says love is a feeling, so it's love is subjective. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, or even if you say, I think what he would mean, of course, is that feeling must be followed up with actions. And we're going to get to that when we get to his point three. Right. But the point is, whatever you say about it, whether it's a feeling or whether it's actions, it's not objective. You can't quantify this. In fact, didn't he say... This isn't perfect love? <laughs> right. Why say that? Right. I mean, if it's from God, wouldn't it be perfect? Well, the, the problem with this is all four of his examples are subjective, and they all lead them to not have assurance. Well, let's look at the second one. What's the second one? The second one, one was uh, humility. Okay, and it was something about being aware of your sinfulness. Yeah, right. And, okay, I get that. Yeah. But, again, this is subjective too, right? Right, right. I mean... Isn't everybody who's in Christianity aware of their sinfulness? Mm -hmm. And if they're concerned about their eternal destiny, if they lack assurance, wouldn't you say they have humility? Right. But this is subjective too, right? Right, yeah. How yeah. do you know you're humble enough? Yeah. Right, yeah. All right, how about the third one? Uh, we finally get to the word that he loves, obedience. Okay, obedience. And again, he said it's not perfect obedience. Right, right. And he has to say that because we all sin, right? First mm -hmm. John 1 8, 1 John 1 10. He says we have a longing to obey. Yeah. Well, okay, I get that, but again, isn't this subjective? Yeah, yeah. I mean, who outside of the Lord Jesus Christ ever obeys perfectly? No, nobody. Yeah. Of course, he yeah. says that. Yeah, right. But the point is, what he doesn't answer is, how do I know I obey enough? Yeah. Yeah. How do I know I'm humble enough? Yeah. How do I know I love enough? Yeah. And let's go to the fourth. What's the fourth issue or test he has? Yeah, the fourth issue was, you know, uh, does your faith survive trials? Or how do you respond to trials? Yeah. yeah. But the truth is, I haven't handled all my trials well. Have you, Mike? No, I definitely not. That's yeah. for sure, yeah. I mean, I've had road rage. I've had depression. I've had lots of anxiety in my life. I've dealt with a lot of perfectionism. I came out of an alcoholic family, and I have a lot of fruit from that. All right. And if I base my assurance on the fact that I handled trials well, well, then I wouldn't have assurance. Right. All four of these things, yeah. love, humility, obedience, handling trials well, yeah. all of them look at me. Right, yeah. They're not looking outside of me to Jesus. Yeah. And what I would suggest is assurance in the Bible 
is taking Jesus at his word. It's believing him for my salvation, which is what John MacArthur said in around 1978. Right, right. right? Yeah, that earlier clip, yeah, you, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I don't think anywhere you see anywhere in the Bible is what he's prescribing here. You know, instead of pointing people to Jesus and the promises in his word, he's pointing to do some introspective looking at yourself. But I can't even tell you how much you need to measure up in these these categories to be, right. to be sure. Right. Yeah. The, the, the problem with all of this is it leads to insecurity. And God is a loving Father who wants us to know with certainty that we are His children forever and that we are secure forever. And so my encouragement to each of you is look at what John MacArthur said 45 years ago and follow that. Don't look at what he's saying today because he has lost his way as a result of Puritan theology. I know he's very well intentioned, but unfortunately he's no longer teaching what he once taught. Yeah. Yeah, we actually need to look to Jesus and the promises of his words. You know, that is 100% true. It'll never fail. If we keep looking at ourselves, looking outside of, you know, anything that distracts from Jesus and his word is going to lead us on a wrong path. That's right. Jesus' promise is objective. Our love, our humility, our obedience, our handling of trials, they're subjective. And so instead of looking within, what do we call it, introspection? Mm -hmm. Let's look outside. I call that extra inspection. <laughs> <laughs> okay, forget extra special, but let's look outside ourselves to Jesus because he's trustworthy. And remember, Mike, what do we always say? Keep grace in focus. And if you like this clip, give it a thumbs up and remember to subscribe to our station. Peace out.